Atlantic Botanical Garden. He's been employed there since October of 15 and has come um, in part, he's going to tell you more, uh, on assignment to do some replantings and renourishments, as I understand it, at Deer Lake State Park. Prior to that, though, he was a Park Service Specialist um, at Topsail Hill Reserve State Park, and he was there from 2012 to 2015. So he has a lot of experience right here in our own area with preservation lands, state park lands, and so on. He was educated at Florida State University and received his BS in political science and government um, in 2004, and he received his MBA from Weber International University in 2007. So I'm kind of thinking we're pretty lucky to have a really smart guy who's <laughs> doing what we love. So without any further ado, announcements at the end, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. Jeff, thank you. Wow. Uh, I'm pretty lucky to be doing what I love. Um, I, as you heard, I don't have an education in biology, but I became a biologist. It's crazy how it works sometimes. Um, so I'm Jeff. Uh, I've been down here in this area since 2007. Um, I'm a Florida native. I was born in Ocala. Uh, lived in Titusville. Went to school in Tallahassee. Went to school in Lake Wales. So I've kind of been all over the state. And I really like it here because I've stayed here pretty much the longest. <laughs> um, so as, as uh, Lori said, I worked at the state parks. Um, I was a ranger at Grayton Beach, which Grayton Beach runs, the management runs Grayton and Deer Lake. And then I got promoted and went over to Topsail and did resource management. Uh, so that was everything, sea turtles, shorebirds, prescribed fire, I did, uh, you know, the whole, ran the whole thing over there. Um, we just did a prescribed burn on Monday over at Topsail, I was out there, some of you may have seen it on 98. Uh, I don't know if you got a chance to see it at night, but it was beautiful at night, with all the fire and the snags. We didn't really want to do that, but uh, it's not bad. Uh, so I'm here tonight to talk about the, uh, the, the three state parks we have in the area, Deer Lake, Grayton, Topsail. There's a lot of similarities between the two, um, and so I'm going to talk first um, a little bit of history about the three parks um, and uh, about you know kind of what, what they offer um, and what you can what you can see there. So we'll start with uh, Grayton. This is an aerial photography aerial photograph of Grayton from 1941. Uh, you can see there's really not much here. All you can see is the town of Grayton here. Wow. Uh, and then this is where Seaside is. Currently, watercolors in this area right here. <clears throat> um, and that was it. There was really nothing here. Uh, the state acquired Grayton Beach State Park in 1968, and the only area that it consisted of was the beach access, which is down here, and the campground, which is located about here. So it was an area about this big, it was the original extent of the state park. They acquired uh, the lands to the north uh, much later in the 80s and the 90s. And Grayton Beach State Park is now about 2,000 acres. It's just a shade under 2,000 acres, uh, most of which is north of 30A and abuts the state forest. Uh, Grayton offers cabins to stay in, 30 cabins to, to uh, stay in. This is a view of the area today. Their cabin area is over here. It's a failed development that the state uh, was able to purchase and put cabins in. They have 30 cabins. Uh, they have around 50 campsites, uh, both for RVs or tents, uh, an old section and a new section. The new section I used to call downtown Grayton because this is where all the big RVs were. They had the skyscraper RVs. Um, you can see that. That's here. That, there. Uh, they also offer a one-mile trail out through the dunes, um, through the iconic pines that everybody takes a picture of from 30A uh, on Western Lake. They have a nature trail that actually runs through that area, so you can actually walk down a boardwalk trail. It's about a mile long. goes through the dunes. You can see a lot of the stuff that I'll be talking about here in a little bit. Uh, they also have a four and a half mile trail that goes, they just put in a brand new parking area. Some of you may have seen right here before the bridge on Western Lake. Uh, nice gravel parking area. You can park there, catch the trail. The trail goes four and a half miles all the way out to 395. So that's four and a half miles back, just, just in case you're pretty bad at math. Uh, and then it also links up, this trail also links up with the state forest uh, hiking trail. So you can actually turn that into a much, much longer hike. And the state forest actually has primitive campsites over by Eastern Lake, and so you can turn it into an overnight hike if you, if you so choose. Uh, so that's kind of what Brayton offers. It's a wonderful park. They gave me my first chance in the park service after two years of trying, so it has a special place in my heart. 
Uh, this is Top Sail around the same time period, 1941. You see, this is Campbell Lake, Morris Lake, Fuller. Again, nothing out there. There's still nothing out there, so that's pretty fantastic. Uh, the area to the north, that's where the uh, hospital, Publix, Grand Boulevard. <clears throat> uh, there was two acquisitions at Top Sail. There was one in um, 1992, and then the one later, 1996, they got this eastern portion over here. And then in 1998, they got the campground, which is about where this corner is at here. This line is about where 30A is, and the campground's in that corner there. Uh, that was a private campground. They have 155 campsites. Uh, they're RV sites. They're posh. They have cable, um, electricity, sewer on all the sites. Um, they also have 32 cabins there, so they have two more than Grayton. Uh, 16 of them are bungalows, uh, which they were, the bungalows were privately owned. The state got the, prop state got the property, the campground. They, uh, the owners sold them to the state. They had to. Um, and the last owner sold his bungalow to the state last year, two years ago. I think he actually, I think he actually he passed, and then it went to the state. Um, so he would come down. It was Mr. Delegard would come down for six months out of the year, and he'd be, that was his house in, in the park. It was really kind of neat. Um, but there are no private ones left in there. So 16 of them are older. They're bungalows. They're all kind of different. And then the state built 16 new cabins in the back where the RV stores used to be. Um, and those are all two bedroom, two bath. They're, they're nice. I, I, we, they call them cabins. They're, it's really like a condo. They got dishwashers and ranges and everything in there. Uh, so Top Sail is really nice. They have around 11 miles of nature trail that go all throughout the park, uh, mostly in the West End. Um, you come into the day use area up front, and then you can catch all these trails off this Campbell Lake Road here. They go out and they basically run the fire lines through throughout the park, and you can see the entirety of the park. They also have a trail um, south of Morris Lake that goes through the dunes. It's really beautiful. You get to see a lot of the dune habitat. So both parks offer uh, a trail through the dunes, an area where you not normally can't go and, and see. <clears throat> And so, finally, I've come to where I currently work at Deer Lake. Uh, this is this is from the '60s, I do believe. Did you have? Uh, this is 1969. You have 30As in this picture here, running through there. Uh, no water sound. No nothing around Camp Creek. Uh, no Seacrest Beach. Um, no, the golf course isn't there. All that. Uh, the line, the green line there is uh, right just south of 98 is where the golf course currently is. Um, and so that's where I currently work. Deer Lake was acquired in 1996, and it's still in a starter park status. Uh, it has a gravel road in, a unimproved parking lot, a clevis uh, a toilet in there. It doesn't have a ranger station. It's got an honor box uh, that you, you pay when you come in. I think it's like $3 to get in. Um, and it has about a mile of beach. Um, Top Sail has three miles of beach. Grayton has about a mile and a half in three different sections. And then um, Deer Lake has about a mile of beach. <laughs> and it's a fantastic boardwalk. They have this fantastic boardwalk, 1,600 feet or so, all the way out to the, to the Gulf. It's elevated. You can look down into the dunes. And uh, it's really beautiful. You can see all kind of stuff out there, um, especially late in the evening. Um, but Deer, there are improvements coming to Deer Lake. There's going to be a 30-lot parking lot uh, coming out there. Um, the, I don't think they're going to put in a ranger station. They're going to put a pavilions, bathroom. They're going to run water out there. And so the improvements are coming. Um, it, they just put them in the management plan, which I'll, I'll talk about management plans here in a little while. Um, and so they want to put some primitive camping out there. Our park manager at, at Grayton in Deer Lake, he's really, he really wants to put some uh, a primitive camping out there where you have to hike, park, hike in, camp, and then come out. Um, but that's in, that's in the works. And then I also work there, which I'll talk about the project that I work on here in a little while, but we are making vast improvements to the wetlands um, in the Camp Creek, Deer Lake, and part of the Eastern Lake watersheds uh, out there at Deer Lake, <clears throat> despite the golf course. <laughs> so the state parks are charged with, with protecting unique areas um, in the state, areas that have special character, special value, and what makes ours unique? It's the dune lakes. These, these are globally rare and imperiled coastal dune lakes. We have them protected. We have Deer Lake. Um, we have Campbell, Morris, part of Stallworth, uh, part of Western. We have a, a large watershed of all these lakes protected, um, both as the lake themselves and in the watershed themselves uh, up in the forest. So Point Washington State Forest, all the state parks, they all protect these watersheds <coughs> for these lakes. This is a picture of Campbell Lake. 
uh, at Top Sail from, from one of the nature trails, so you can get this view if you go out there. Uh, this is from the western end of Campbell Lake, looking east. <laughs> um, so the coastal dune lakes, they're brackish um, in salinity. Uh, each, each lake is different. They all have their own character. This is, again, this is another view of the uh, western side of Campbell Lake. Campbell Lake almost never opens up to the, to the Gulf. Um, of course, they told me that. I got to top sail the biologist of District 1. She's like, you'll never see it open. I only saw it once. And then when I was there, I saw it before times. So, <laughs> but it really does. It, it hardly ever opens because the way the outfall goes, um, it, water doesn't come in, and there's kind of a berm, so water's got to get really high for it to get out. So that big rain we had in 2014, it gushed out pretty good. <clears throat> so Campbell Lake, mostly fresh. Morris Lake, mostly fresh. Western Lake has a good exchange most of the time through Grayton. Uh, Deer Lake has a good exchange, so the salinity on those two lakes varies much more uh, than the two um, at Top Sail. Uh, Stallworth as well, that varies quite a bit as well. Um, so we have this nice tea-colored water, that's, that's the breakdown of organics um, in the woods. So all that water flowing through the wetlands, uh, pine needles, oak leaves, branches, uh, grasses, grass thatch, all that stuff leaches out tannic acid and it accumulates in the water and so that's why we have this nice beautiful reddish brown water that contrasts so well with our emerald green waters. Uh, this is the outfall here at, uh, at Morris Lake. I'm sure on the beach you guys get a lot of questions about the dirty water yeah. Yeah. and, and it's, it's really not. It's just, it's just slightly acidic and it, had just, it just has a little color. It has a little flair. Uh, and so you can see how the, the outfalls shape the, uh, the dunes as they, as they move out through the beach. This, I watched uh, the Morris Lake outfall sweep up and down the beach at Topsail over my, over my three years there. I would take a picture from the top of that dune. Uh, I'll show you in a second. Uh, talking about the outfalls. I would take a picture from the top of the dune looking down onto the outfall so I could accumulate and see how it moved. And I've, I watched it go all the way down there and then go an equal distance all the way back down to the west. And it, like in just in, in just a matter of months. Um, it just it, that's how it was naturally. I've seen this area fill up here almost completely with water, and it bust out, and it get real trickle, and then the, I've seen it with almost no water. It's it's really amazing to watch it um, uh, from just day to day. And sometimes you can't cross it because the sand gets really soft and trucks get stuck. <clears throat> uh, this is the outfall at, at Stallworth Lake. Um, that one also is, has, has a lot of movement as well. That will go up and down the beach. I don't know if anybody goes to the beach access over there at uh, Stallworth Preserve, uh, but that's a good place to see it. You can walk down uh, just off the county boardwalk, and it's not very far down to the, to the uh, Stallworth Lake outfall. And you, know, you can also walk up um, into uh, Stallworth Lake and get a good view of the park on the left and the houses on the right. You can see the contrast between the two. There's some really beautiful... Um, um, Maritime hammock and scrub out there, just north of Stallworth Lake. It's really beautiful. Um, one thing I will tell you too is, uh, Walton County allows dogs on the beach. The state parks do not allow dogs at all, if, if even if you have a permit. So they are not allowed to be in the state parks at all. And one of the things I did at Top Sail, I kept the tally marks. I would go before work and after work. I'd stand on that boardwalk over there, Staller Preserve, and then I would catch people before they got to the park and with their dogs there, and just ask them. You know, I just want to let you know you can't have your dog past that point. You see my sign down there where the, where the uh, park boundary is right here. Because um, they'd always, there's nobody that way, so everybody wants to bring their dogs in there. They want to run down where there's, where there's nobody, let them run off the leash. And uh, so I would educate them on why they, didn't, why they couldn't do that. Walton County has 26 miles of beaches. There's roughly six miles preserved in the state parks, a little bit less. So that gives them 20 miles with which to walk their dog. I just asked them if they would just please stay off this other six. And we'll see why here in a minute. Uh, so these outfalls, they shape the dunes. This is an outfall that you will rarely, rarely ever see. There's a lake in at Topsail, uh, no name lake. There's a trail down to it. It's just a little short little side trail. It's not even a quarter mile long. And no name lake is not considered a coastal dune lake, but it kind of is because it always has water within a mile. It fits all the criteria. Uh, it just Nobody's ever seen it open. And this is the outfall uh, after 2014 of No Name Lake. It's, it's, it's got a long way to go. It comes out of No Name Lake, goes way down the dunes, it fills that, fills that up, and it comes way back down the front. And it, and it curves out. And I, when I worked there, I'd come off the boardwalk, and I'd go to the beach, and I'd hang a left, and I would see the dunes, and the dunes had this big dip. And 
I would always just assume that it was a dip from Opal. Opal had, there's a lot of, of washout areas where Opal came in in 96, 95 and washed the dunes back, which is great shorebird nesting area, but you have these dips in the dunes. And I can never understand why that one was there because the back area, did, there was no really overwash in there. And I got my answer in 2014. It was it's the outfall for, for No Name Lake. <clears throat> what was really neat is that outfall ran out to the beach, ran out to the gulf. As it started to sweep to the west, it met up with the Campbell Lake outfall and they both flowed out together. Wow. It, was really, it was really quite something. So after a big rain, go to the park. You see all kind of neat stuff. Um, and so these areas shape um, are really good for, for rare plants and animals. These dune areas and these outfall areas. This is the endemic um, Gulf Coast lupine. It's really pretty. It blooms in the spring. I love it, but I also hate it because it doesn't bloom long enough. It's only, it only blooms for about two weeks. and it's, I just want more. I really just want more. Uh, it's one of my favorites. I love the, the purple, the variation of the colors of purple. You know, sometimes they're deep, sometimes they're really light. It's got that just really nice kind of leathery flowers. Um, one of my one of my favorites. And there's always kind of you get close to be able to get close enough to one. You can find all kind of stuff in them if you look down in there. Spiders and all kind of neat stuff in there going on. Some of you may not like spiders, but uh, we have jumping spiders, especially out at the beach. That regal ones. They're called regal jumping spiders, and they'll they get angry and they'll stick their arms out like this, you know, and like kind of scare you off. But when you look, they have these really like bright metallic green. I don't know what they're called, chompers, I'm not an insectologist, but they have these really like metallic green uh, things on their, right, right below their face, uh, and it's really pretty. And I love jumping spiders too, they, I get them in the house all the time, they're like little pets. Uh, so this is a woody goldenrod, this is a fall bloomer, you'll see this in bloom, um, well uh, it's near the end now, but you'll see this a lot in the uplands, out in the dunes, um, it's part of our yellow blanket that we have out in the dunes. Um, and it's loved by our, our monarch butterflies and our other, other passers-by, our other fall migrants. Um, they, really like the, they really like these yellow flowers. Um, so you see a lot of woody goldenrod uh, out there. And it's usually mixed in with an endangered plant called Cruz's golden aster. Uh, these are out in the dunes. Um, you'll see in the next picture. But they have kind of a, they lay along the ground. They kind of have these long arms. Um, and they also bloom in the fall. All these kind of bloom at the same time in the, in the fall, the yellow ones here. There's another one called Godfrey's Golden Aster. It's not as, uh, you don't see it as much. It's just not as showy. Uh, it's kind of low, it's kind of like leathery green. It's got leaves that are sort of similar, kind of really hairy like the, uh, like the lupine. Um, and it just grows along the ground. But it also blooms at the same time. The flowers are hard to see because they fall and then they open up like that. And so they're, they're, they don't you don't really see those as much, but that's also endangered. It's one of the things that, that occurs out in the dunes. <clears throat> so this is a fall picture from the south of Morris Lake looking north through the dunes. This is your Cruz's Golden Aster here, these long kind of arms here. They kind of lay along the ground, a little bunch of heads. These other yellow flowers that are sort of mixed in there is honeycomb head. And that's, that blooms in October. And uh, it's... Pretty, it's really common. You see it all throughout the dunes. It's really, it's one of the main yellow flowers that you see in the dunes. It kind of, it'll carpet an area. It's important. Here's the woody goldenrod too. Not, not quite ready to bloom yet. It's a little bit later than those. Um, but the the honeycomb head is important because it's the sole food plant uh, of the endemic solitary bee. This is the only solitary bee to occur east of the Mississippi. Every, every, they all occur west, uh, out, usually out in the desert. Uh, sand dwellers. It's not a colony um, bee. It's just a. It's just. It's, it's just a solitary bee. There's actually not even really a name for it. There's not much known about it. We did some research at Top Sail to try to find where they go because we don't know where they go. They go underground, but we don't know where. And so we would take the, the previous picture was actually during one of these excursions. We would take this UV dust. It was like pink and green. And just we would catch these bees during the day because they're they land on the plants they're pretty easy just scoop them up we'd give them a dusting of this UV dust and then we came back out at night with a black light and we could see everywhere where that bee had gone except we couldn't find out where it went <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we also did it a little bit late in the year um, and then I left and we never had a chance to come back to it um, and so hopefully in the future we can we can actually learn some more. Uh, about it, but there's not much research on these other than the fact that we know that they weather hurricanes really well. We know that they come out in October at the same time that the honeycomb head, which is what it's on there, blooms. 
um, and then it goes underground for the rest of the year. It lays its eggs and has all these all this pollen from these plants. That's really about it. But they're really neat, uh, and they're really hard to follow when they're flying. <laughs> Uh, so another endangered plant that we have is the large leaf jointweed. Um, you'll see this uh, scattered throughout the dunes and in some of the higher uh, scrub areas that we have in the parks. Um, another name for it is, is, is October flower. It, it comes out also in October. Um, there's several different species of this plant. This particular species um, is sort of tall and it looks very sickly at the bottom. It looks like it forgot to grow leaves and it has like kind of this woody stem and it has these large kind of leathery leaves. And then it gets these beautiful white flowers that turn pink as they age um, through, the, through the fall. But this comes out in the fall as well. And that is, that's endangered. It's one of the endangered plants that all three parks have and protect. Um, anybody have wisteria in their yard? Chinese wisteria? It smells great. I love Chinese wisteria. It smells so good. Uh, but we have an American version that's not uh, an exotic invasive and won't take over um, when you plant it. Um, this, you'll see this around the edge of the lakes. The flowers are really pretty, uh, kind of a muted purple, um, and they look a little bit different. Uh, they don't quite smell as strong, but still really pretty. <coughs> this is another endemic um, plant that we have here, which means it only occurs along in this area in the Panhandle. Uh, the Panhandle Meadow Beauty. Um, we have several species of Meadow Beauty. Uh, Rexia is the, is the genus for it. And uh, this one is the only one that only occurs here. And it's pretty rare. It grows only in open sandy areas along the edge of the lake. There's a large population of it on the north side of Campbell Lake. Um, a large population of it in an ephemeral pond that's just to the east, or just yeah, just to the east of No Name Lake at Top Sail. Um, it is uh, on the south side of Western Lake, and then there is some, oddly enough, because of course nothing ever follows the rules. It's in the middle of a, of a fire lane on the north side of Deer Lake, in some sand hill, nowhere near water. Um, but mostly it occurs near water in the sandy edges. And you can tell, because it looks very similar to several other species of Rexia, but you can tell what it is because the leaves are turned 90 degrees. So instead of coming out flat, the leaves are turned like that. They come out of the stem and then they, they are, they're rotated up 90 degrees. And so that's how you can tell which, which uh, species of Rexia. There's other, lots of other ways too. The number of like the hairs on the, on the Grecian urn, I call it there. Um, and all sorts of things like that. But that's the telltale way to be able to tell what you're looking at on that one. And they also vary widely in their color. They also are very muted uh, pink to a very like, kind of a dark magenta. And as with all Rexias, the petals will fall off very easy. So if you disturb it, it'll, the petals will fall off. <coughs> so these areas are also critical not just for plants but also for, for wildlife. Uh, this is an endangered Choctahatchee beach mouse, um, which we have runs through, through the dunes, anywhere where there's dunes. There's a large population at Top Sail. There is a medium population at both Creighton and Deer Lake. And we have taken, <coughs> there's a very large population at Top Sail. We've taken um, mice from Top Sail. In 2010, we trapped mice at Top Sail. And then we brought them over to the Pine Street area of Grayton Beach, which is the western side of the town of Grayton, uh, between Grayton Beach and Gulf Trace. Um, and so we augmented the, that population of mice out there, um, and also we just did in, uh, back in January, no, nope, year before last, uh, two Januarys ago, we took mice again um, from Top Sail and augmented the population over at Grayton. Um, the red bar is on the eastern boundary or near the eastern boundary of Grayton. There's also watercolors on the. Oh, I'm sorry, I get that back. I get, I get mixed up in my directions. I'm from the East Coast. Um, <laughs> So watercolors on the, on the eastern yeah. boundary, red bars on the western boundary, both have, um, at, at, at times, have had cat populations, feral cat populations, and they are devastating to beach mice. The cat and mouse thing is not just a cartoon, it is in reality what happens. Uh, they do hunt them and they will kill them. Um, and so we noticed a dip there at Grayton, and so what we did was augmented the, the population by bringing in new DNA, because once the population gets small enough, then they start interbreeding, and that's no good for anybody. Um, and so we, we brought in additional mice from top sale to, to augment the population there to, so they would have uh, a greater DNA uh, bank we wish to choose from there. Um, and it worked. We, did, we checked it. Um, we went out with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and uh, trapped, and they took DNA samples. And they're doing, they're, they are healthy. It will decline again, and we will probably end up having to do it again. Um, but that's sort of one of the problems of being 
I guess, an island where you have development on both sides. They can't expand anywhere. They can only expand within where they're at. So there is a limit to the population um, in, within the parks. Uh, topsail has a much bigger limit, and it, it's not as prone to fail <coughs> catastrophically if something happens. Because, I mean, they're hunted by owls and foxes and raccoons and, like, all sorts of things that are out there. And, and so, you know, it's, they can, it's a lot easier to handle in a big area like topsail. So this is them in their, in their habitat here. This is during a night of trapping. Trapping is pretty fun. You have to be up all night. You set the traps during the day. You come out at night, and then you have to walk these you know, long transects where you get traps set up. And usually you do it over four nights, four nights in a row, because uh, it takes a little time for the mice to find it, because they have kind of a big area. So they may not find your trap the first night. Uh, and what they'll do is uh, we put a little seed in there, and then you find them. Like they clip the ear to get a little DNA, um, and then, or see if it has a, an ear clip. Uh, if the nose has been caught before, you give it an ear clip, and then you release them, off they go. But it has to be done at night, because if they can't be in the traps during the day, they will, they will die in the traps. Uh, so it has to be all done at night. Um, they also, the parks, all three parks, and I did this uh, while I was at Top Sale, they track the mice. So we don't, we, that's how we know that we have a, a healthy population. Uh, we don't trap them all the time, we just trap them all the time. And so we use a PVC tube with a 90 degree elbow and a PVC with a cap on the end. Uh, a little piece of cardstock that'll fit in there. And then on the end is a um, ink pad. So you put a little, a little food safe ink on the end. You put some seeds in the back. And when they come up through the tube, because they run up to get the seeds, they run across the ink pad, they leave footprints on the, on the card. Out they go. And then once a month you go out there, you pull all the cards. Top side, 32 of them, it took me all day. Uh, and you, would, you could look, you pull the card out and you'd see footprints on it. And you could distinguish, you know, most of the time there were beach mice prints, but you could distinguish rats, uh, field mice. Um, I found a snake in there one time, a black racer was curled up in there. I don't know how he fit. PVC is like that, this is a big snake. But he fit, he was in there, waiting on a meal. Uh, waiting on a meal. Yeah. And uh, so, um, but and I've, after the flooding events that we've had where the water's gotten high in the dunes, they've actually used the tubes to, as like nesting areas. They'll move out of from underground because they burrow underground. They would come out and they would use that as a, like they had all, all their whole nesting material in there. Um, so that's how, the, that's how we know at the parks that the population, where they're at and how they're doing. So it's, it's just a presence or absence, whether they're there, whether they're not, and then where um, in the dunes they are. And they track them at Deer Lake at Grayton and at Top Sail. They have to track them in all three parks. And so far, we've, we still have mice at all three parks. <clears throat> but they are incredibly cute. <laughs> uh, so the lakes also serve as a nice area for uh, wading birds. Um, these, are, these are, you'll end up seeing a lot of these, especially throughout the year uh, as the migration comes through. These are little blue herons on Stallworth Lake. Um, and they are sort of like their bigger cousins. They just have a, they're, Bill is blue on the sides, a little bit smaller, and they're really pretty. Uh, the reddish egret, which is um, sort of a rarity. You don't see this a whole lot. Um, this is at Western Lake. They're really pretty. They have really pretty eyes. Um, I don't know if you see the eye there. But there's also a white morph of the reddish egret, and that's how you can tell by the color of its eyes and the bill. Um, it'll be just like this, but completely white. And those are extremely rare, and there, was, there has been one um, in the past at Western Lake that would come regularly to the Western Lake Outfall. You can see, you can see it all the time. <coughs> uh, little green herons. Uh, you'll see those scampering along the side, picking up small fish and frogs. Um, you see those a lot, especially in the wetlands. Um, they can change their appearance quite a bit. Their, their neck will get, can either be really long, and you go, what is that? Or it'll be really short, and you go, oh, it's a green heron. Because <coughs> they don't look like themselves. And they're not really green, so I don't know why they call them that. <laughs> Uh, this is one of my favorites, the tricolored. Um, it looks like it's about the same size and looks like the reddish egret. Uh, it's got the, the rusty red kind of neck. It's got like a, kind of a blue heron back with that uh, gray blue, and then on the whole underside of its neck is white. Um, and they, they stand there a little bit bigger than the reddish egret, just slightly. Uh, but you see those in the migration. Um, uh, summertime is when I took this picture uh, back in July. Um, and you'll see those kind of come through. Uh, Stallworth Lake is a great place to see those. Uh, these are snow egrets. Um, they are known as the bird with the golden shoes. You can sort of see it through here. They have, they have yellow feet. 
they are. They look like cattle egrets. We get, we get a lot of cattle egrets here. Those are, are an exotic species. They are, they're not native. They're not from here. They were introduced. Uh, and they're, the main, they're about the same size. You can't see the feet. The cattle egret has a brown streak running down the back of his neck. It's kind of a buff brown, not very big. Whereas these will always be all white. Very pure white. Um, and always with the golden shoes. Uh, and this is in the breeding plumage here. You can see they have their almost killed off. The ladies used to like these feathers for their hats. Breeding feathers here. They hang off. Back in the 20s, I believe, uh, they would shoot whole rookeries of these, and they almost they almost died out. There, there almost were none left. Uh, but thankfully they are, because now we get to enjoy them in, in their natural habitat. And then, of course, great blues. Uh, this particular bird, I used to see every morning when I went into topsail, and it had a real hankering for snakes. Every morning I would Yay! see this I would see this bird eating snakes. <laughs> this is actually it's actually this is not a snake that it has right here. This is actually a glass lizard. Um, it's a legless lizard that we have. They will break off their tail um, and it, it the way it breaks off is pretty smooth so it, it looks like it's glass. That's why they call them glass lizard. glass snakes or glass lizards. You can tell what it is because it has a lizard face and no legs. <laughs> but they slither along the ground. And they're really pretty too. They have they have nice kind of modeling color on them. Um, they just look a little bit different. You see, and you go, that doesn't look right. That's probably what you're looking at. <laughs> uh, so the other thing we have are uh, nesting shorebirds. Uh, you'll see these uh, signs out there. And I know Bonnie came and did a talk on shorebirds here. Um, we have least terns. They are colony nesters. This is a male bird here. I think it's presenting this fish to this female here, in, in hopes that they can make some make some eggs. Um, and uh, that's what they do. They'll fly out, catch some fish, bring it back, present it to the female. Hey, look at me, I'm a great fisherman. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then they'll nest in a colony, nest in a big colony. And we have a big colony at, at Grayton on the Western Lake Outfall on the State Park side. Um, this is from a couple of years ago. I was going over every Saturday because we have to do nest counts, uh, bird counts, and count the chicks and everything. And uh, this is why you want to stay away from uh, bird nesting areas and away from the, the fencing, and also why you don't want to have dogs on the beach. These birds are flush up here. This is my coworker here, Marvin. Works, he works, well, he works in the parks now. He did work for Audubon. Uh, he's counting eggs, but the birds don't like when you come near, and they will flush off the nest. And they nest in the summertime. So those eggs will heat up, and the birds or the chicks, the, the eggs can cook and, and become uh, unviable. The chicks can be exposed uh, to the elements, um, or you know, could go hungry. So the longer these birds are off the nest, the worse it is for, for the chicks. I mean, they, they, they can be off for a little while, but it, if it keeps repeating, you know, it's very difficult to grade because you have the drive on area. It's really close to the outfall, um, and so there's constantly people going by there. But as long, we try to give enough space with the, with the roping and everything that they aren't disturbed. We had some issues this year with the, the nest. I mean, you can't tell these birds where to nest, they don't listen. And so they were nesting like right next to the access road at Grayton and also right next to the drive on portion over at Grayton. And so um, they were, it was, we always have moderate success over there. Uh, the larger the colony, the better because then they can absorb those numbers. So as things predate them, foxes and all that stuff, they can absorb those numbers. Um, I tried really hard at, at, at Top Sale to get them to nest over there. I put out um, uh, decoys. Like wood cutouts, uh, birds looked like they were on a nest, um, and they would come in for a little while. I had probably the biggest heartbreak of my entire career in the Park Service. I watched this these these terns. They nested over by the Morris Lake outfall, and they I watched I watched over that nest. I was like a brooding father over that nest. I'd go out there every single day, make sure they were okay. I I ran after a coyote uh, that was out there one day. Um, I came over top of the dune. He was kind of meandering through the area, and I just took off. And then I realized, what am I going to do if I catch this dog? Because <laughs> he was going to bite me. <laughs> but I chased them off. They, they're, they're skittish, so I, I chased them off out of there. I waited and waited and waited. I was out there. The, the chicks had just hatched. I came down the beach, and when I came back, they were out of the eggs. Uh, the parents had taken the eggs away from the nest, so nothing would come get them. Overnight, we had this big storm. I came in the next day, and they were gone. Aww. And they didn't, they didn't make it. There was, it was only two birds. There was no colony. It was just, they had gotten taken by a coyote. Uh, the parents were still there in the morning, waiting, like, over the cup, waiting. Um, I got the coyote on camera. And, uh, I had a game camera set up out there. So I know which one did it, if I ever see him. <laughs> uh, but it was, it, 
that, that's sort of how it is sometimes. Sometimes I make it, sometimes I don't. It's part of the natural process. Um, and, but they are really, this is before, this is directly out of the egg. This is before their feathers have been able to puff up. You can see the top one there starting to get the downy feathers as they dry out, but this is fresh. Um, and that's what they look like after, after they uh, fluff up a little bit. Um, extremely cute, and they bounce around the, around the beach, get fed by their parents. Um, but those are, those are least terns. This is the, an egg cup of a snowy plover. Um, we have snowy plovers that nest in all three parks. Uh, top sail, didn't have a nest for a long time. I worked really hard, to, like I said, to keep the dogs off the beach. I worked really hard to, uh, to monitor the beach and make sure that you know, everything was good. And we actually had our, while I was there, we had our first uh, snowy plover fledgling in 10 years. Wow. And, um, and so every year since, they've had, there's been increasing the number of birds that they've had there. And it really all kind of started with a, with a killdeer. I don't know if you know what killdeer are. They're a type of plover. Um, they nested first and had successful chicks. And that is like key when you're trying to get birds to nest on the beach is to have success because other birds, they, I guess they talked to the bird for grapevine, but they, they found <laughs> out about it. And then we started having successful nesting of other, other species. So, but this is, this is how you see it. This, they just nest right on the beach, right in the open sand. Their eggs are you know, colored like the sand. Um, and it's, they're very exposed uh, most of the time, and uh, they don't they don't nest in colonies. They are solitary nesters. <clears throat> but they use the uh, outfalls, the lakes, to raise their chicks. Um, they run them up and down the beach. A great, and I followed a family, um, sort of like I did at Top Sail, although this time was a success when I was at Grayton. Uh, they, we had they had fled they fledged all three chicks, hatched and fledged all three chicks, which was unheard of. Usually it's out of three, maybe you get one, sometimes two, hardly ever get three. Um, and I call them, we put bands on the leg, which you, you can kind of see in the top bird there. They, they had all had blue bands, so I call them the Blues, uh, blues Brothers. <laughs> um, and we do that so we can track the birds through their lifetime, know where they go, uh, where they nest, who their children are, who their parents were, so you can build this database of information about these birds. Because there's only, uh, I think, 300 pair in the entire state. And so it's very easy to track them because there's, the numbers are so low. These birds will go extinct. They are going extinct. They are, not, um, they are not reproducing at a rate that can maintain the species as it is right now. And so we're, that's why we're working very hard. And part of the project I work on is tied to this. But that's why we're working very hard to get these numbers back up. Um, they're naturally predated by natural things, but they are also affected by human behaviors on the beach. Dogs, constant flushing. Um, all sorts of things like that. They get run over when you know people drive through areas they're not supposed to drive through, and so those numbers we need to improve because the natural numbers are basically what they're going to be. Um, and, and they're like little cotton balls with feet. They're adorable. <laughs> and so they, this is what they do when they're when they're flushed when the babies. Shorebirds chicks are precocious when they're hatched. So unlike a cardinal or a mockingbird who has to stay in the nest. They can't fly and do anything, have to be fed. These birds can feed immediately out of the egg. So they run, they get up, they shake it off, and then they run down the beach, and the parents show them where to, where to eat. And so that's why these outfalls make, the state parks in particular, make great areas for them to, to raise their chicks. There's plenty of food. You got fresh and salt water mix. You got a mix of foods out there, and it's, really, it's, it's a really healthy place for them, for them to, to be. Uh, so the parents will run them up and down the beach. I watched that pair at uh, Great and Run, all the way from Watercolor all the way down to Western Lake. They were all over the place. I had to go out there and try to find them. It was a, it was a nightmare. But when, they, when they're scared, this is what they do. They lay down. And so they'll lay down on a low spot. So if there's a tire track, mm. if there's a footprint, they'll lay in that. And so a lot of times when people drive through the state parks, they will drive on the tire tracks that they went through before. Or they'll drive down the rack line that's down by the water. And that's how a lot of these chicks will end up dead, is because they will, they'll get run over, because that's what they do. They get scared, they're camouflaged, and so they lay down. They can't fly. <coughs> um, so one of the things we do when we ban them, they're really easy to catch, because they can't fly. <laughs> so you just run up and, and you can grab them, and you just look like a fool running around the dunes trying to grab these little tiny birds. Um, but that's what they look like. We take them in, they weigh them, they measure them. You know, we put uh, plastic bands around the legs that are really light. They don't affect the bird uh, in the lifetime. We have seen in the past occasionally uh, it hasn't been sealed right. You know, it'll pinch the leg. But they, we recatch the bird and then and, and, and fix it because these birds are almost under constant observation, um, whether they know it or not. Um, they 
during the nesting season, the biologists come out once a week and do a nest search. They walk through the dunes, look for nests, and it's really easy to tell because the bird will act like it has a broken wing. She'll try to get you to run away from the nest, so she'll run around with her wing kind of flapping. So you know that you're near a nest. Um, they, um, and then in the winter, uh, or through the summer, or through the winter, uh, every two weeks they come out and they find them. They'll spot birds, look at the bands, see what bird is where, um, and, and they'll band them if they don't if they don't have a band on them. And so all three parks are, are key for protecting these species, but they're key for protecting other species as well, migratory species that are endangered or otherwise threatened. This is a piping plover. Uh, that migrates through. Um, you'll see it in a lot of publications that they occur on the beach. They will migrate through. They don't nest here, um, but they, uh, you'll, this one has bands on the legs you can see here. This is the band I was talking about. This one, this bird was banded, I think, up in the Great Lakes region of the United States and it migrated down through here. And that's at the Morris Lake Outfall, a great place to stop on your, on your way down somewhere else. Wilson's plover, also a listed species. No bands on this one, but you will see bands on those as well. I don't expect you to remember all these. <laughs> uh, this is a black belly plover. You'll see these a lot. These are bigger than the snowy plovers. Uh, you'll see these a lot down by the water's edge. Um, and a lot of times the first year chicks will stay here through the breeding season. Um, and you can tell they have, a, they have a black belly. They look very similar to the American golden plover, which I have yet to see here uh, one day. One day. But you, they, you see these a lot throughout the winter. Um, on the beach, you may get asked about these. We have sanderlings, which are very common. They run up and down the little, we, call, we also call them peeps. They run up and down at the, at the uh, water line. They, my favorite thing is when they turn their back to the wind, bristle their back, and then run, somebody up, run another bird off. Um, but you also you see them pecking at the water line. Snowy plovers, you'll rarely see at the water line. They're usually higher on the beach. Uh, but you may see these mixed in sometimes. And this is a ruddy turnstone. And the name is, is not... That actually has a meaning. They actually do turn stones over in, in rivers and river bottoms and stuff. Um, and they sort of waddle. It's kind of funny. They sort of waddle on the beach. But it looks a little bit different than uh, the regular ones that we have. And um, I know I've been on the beach and I've been asked, you know, what, what bird is that? Because it doesn't look the same. But that is a male on the left and a female on the right. And that is in breeding plumage. Um, and you can tell that's what it is because it has really bright orange legs. <clears throat> These are American avocets. Um, easy to tell, they're a little bit taller than most birds that occur out there, and their bill is upturned. As you can see there, it's got a little bit of upturned. Great picture. Uh, this is a black neck stilt. Um, always bring the tuxedo to the party. Um, this is in the Morris Lake Outfall. There was, Morris Lake Outfall was great for, for migratory, migrating birds. Um, and that's one you might see, and they're beautiful. And I hope you get a chance to see one one day. This is a uh, black skimmer. They will nest here. They are really hard to bring in. They're, they're ones that need uh, successful nesting. So I, we need to have successful least turn nesting in order to get them to be able to come in and do that. But they have a very long lower portion, it's hard to see here, a long lower portion of the bill. And they fly low along the water and skim the water. And when they feel something, they snap it shut and that's how they catch their fish. So they, that's why they have those nice long wings, get a nice ground effect over the water. They just kind of lope along and they just they skim the water. <coughs> They also, sometimes you'll see them laying out completely flat on the beach with their head out, look like they're dead, but they're not. That's just how they rest. I guess the bill's heavy, they have to carry that around all the time. <laughs> uh, so you may see, um, people may ask you about some dark stuff on the beach. They think maybe it's oil sometimes. Um, this is an outcropping of humate, uh, or sometimes it's also called peat. This was taken over by watercolor on Brayton Beach. Uh, and you can see, I like this picture because you can really see the plant fibers in here. This is the remnants of the old forest that used to have occurred here before uh, the sand came in and covered it up. So it's been compressed. Um, and it doesn't allow water to escape. That's how our water stays in these dune lakes and not, is not able to escape under the sand and out into the gulf. It does escape out into the gulf through submarine groundwater discharge, just not as deep. It doesn't disappear. That's how, that's how all of this gets held in. Uh, to that. So if you see something like this on the beach, or pieces of this, usually you can break it apart. It's kind of crumbly. Uh, you'll see plant fibers in it. It'll be kind of brown. It'll be maybe a little bit greasy um, to the touch. Uh, but that's just a breakdown of organic materials, not, not oil. But that's what keeps the dune lakes from disappearing. <clears throat> this is after the uh, heavy rain event in 2014. This is the Campbell Lake outfall. Uh, and so this water is rushing out, reshaping these dunes. And then what was left was this, wait, all 
walk down through there. So if somebody asks you about it and they want to go see some, a great place to see it, even still right now, um, is from the boardwalk at Top Sail. Because you can look out into the Campbell Lake outfall and you can see those outcroppings of the humate um, uh, out there. <clears throat> That's why that, that outfall is, has, still has water in it, it's still just sitting there. Can't go anywhere. So all three of our state parks support a healthy forest and a richness of species. Um, and they protect uh, some of the most diverse ecosystems in the planet. Um, and we, we carefully maintain those uh, with, with resource management techniques like prescribed fire. Um, this was taken, the previous one was taken on Campbell Lake. This is on the Camp Creek, the creek, not the lake, uh, the creek that feeds into the lake uh, on the northern edge at Deer Lake. Um, and so we manage those mainly with fire. Um, so some of the areas you'll see are pine flatwoods. Uh, Florida Natural Areas Inventory has a host of different ecosystems, but for our purposes, pine flatwoods is mostly what you'll see out there. Saw palmetto, gallberry, uh, longleaf pine, slash pine. This has a um, cat face from the turpentine industry that took place out here. You'll see those a lot at Top Sail, um, at Grayton, and a little less so at Deer Lake. They mostly cut the trees at Deer Lake. They mostly turpentine the tree at the Top Sail. Grayton is sort of in between. <coughs> So this is a very typical view of some of the woods that you'll see out there. And we maintain these woods with prescribed fire like we did on Monday over at, at Top Sail. This is some pine flatwoods uh, over at Deer Lake that we, that we burned there. Um, and that's exactly how you want to see it. Low, not big flame heights, and <laughs> really, hate to say under control, but sort of under control. <laughs> um, sand hill, these are the upland portions between the wetlands. You'll see a lot of open space with, with uh, sand. Turkey oak, slash pine, um, wire grass in there. You see, that's where you see a lot of your upland species there. These also burn, just not as well, um, but we do maintain them with fire. Um, they would be much healthier if they had an uneven age of, of pine trees on them. Um, a lot of these lands that, the, that were, are in the state parks were owned by St. Joe. They cut a lot of timber out, and so these areas are still in recovery. But a lot of our, a lot of our uplands, especially at Deer Lake, have been burned for 20 years or more. And so they're in pretty good shape. We're starting to see quail, hawk squirrels, turkeys, all the stuff you would want to see in these healthy areas starting to come back. I, never, I didn't see those when I started in 2008. I see them now. Um, the other one, and the most important one to me, and these are some of the most diverse ecosystems anywhere in the world that we have here, are our wet prairies. <clears throat> this is a wet prairie at Top Sail. This is a wet prairie at Deer Lake. Look very similar, uh, but they are worlds different. Uh, there's, there's so much different uh, stuff going on in each of them. But both have pitcher plants, which are carnivorous plants that we have that grow in our wetlands here. Uh, seepage slopes, which are very similar to the wet prairies. They also have orchids, pitcher plants, carnivorous plants. And they occur along the edge of, uh, edge of streams. So you have a sand hill, grades down kind of into some pine flatwoods, grades down into, into either a wet prairie or a seepage slope, and then into a creek, like this one here. Uh, water seeps out of the hill on a seepage slope, and that's why it stays wet, whereas a wet prairie is more of a kind of a depression in the middle, um, and so it's sort of just low and holds water. This is Camp Creek itself. You see that nice tannic water in there. <coughs> so this is kind of brings me to what another resource management technique that we use and why I have a job. Um, and this is looking into a Tai Tai wetland. This area should be open and herbaceous, just like the wet prairies uh, pictures that you saw before. It's kind of hard to believe, but these areas haven't been burned for 80 or more years in some cases. And when that happens, you get, a, you get an imbalance. A lot of these, all these ecosystems I just showed you all need fire in order to maintain themselves. And that would have occurred naturally if, you know, there, without human influence of cutting roads, putting houses in, doing all the stuff. And so now we can't let wildfires burn because we have houses and we have all the stuff. We have roads and it's very dangerous. So we, we burn them on a kind of on a schedule. But that wasn't always the case. Fires were bad for a long time. And what happened is Tai Tai got out of control. And Tai Tai is a native tree, grows here, um, grows in, in wet areas. But when you don't burn it, when you don't burn these areas, it actually spreads out, spreads uphill. And so this is looking down into what should be a wet prairie with grasses and pitch plants. This is what it looks like on the inside. And that shade is bad. Because all of those plants that I just named need sun. So in the past, the Park Service has tried to burn their way out of it. They try to burn into these wetlands uh, and kill these trees back, but that doesn't really, that doesn't really work. 
because uh, you only get the burn one side, it doesn't go in all the way, and it would take forever. So we came up with this project back in 96, I think, is when the genesis of the project was. We finally got money in 2015, uh, around $3 million or so to do this. We just got doubled, so we're close to $6 million on this project. Um, and we hand cut it out. That's the only way we can do it. We have a crew of, of six that work for the state park. I work for Atlanta Botanical, so I do the ecological side. I take data, um, help with project management, project coordination. Um, and the crew of six, they use machines like this. This is a feller buncher. Got a big disc at the bottom. They'll grab the trees. They take them out, lay them on the thing. They chip them up and re remove the nutrients out. Because the other thing that these weapons need is very low nutrients. Um, but they also do it by hand with chainsaws. They drag them out. And so it's, it's trying to be, we try to do it very light on these areas of wet. We try to do it very light on the, on the ground. So this is an area here, Lake. You see the chipper there, tractor. You can see this, this is the, there's a stream running down here. This is the Tai Tai Edge there. And from the same spot, opened up. And this is going to be all open and grassy. There's going to be pitcher plants, wire grass. It's going to be all open and grassy down through there. This is uh, about a year later. And then again, after we recut it, but the tie tie grows back and we go back. We don't want to use any herbicides. It can be very dangerous for amphibians and all sorts of stuff. These are very, very sensitive areas. And so we're trying to do this as light on the landscape as possible. <coughs> we're also burning these parcels separate from the other parcels. There's our chip pile there. So like I said, we take all those trees, we chip them up. And then we, we, have a, we actually had to paying a guy to come get them. He takes them to the Panama City paper mill and then they burn them up for fuel wood. They're not really good for landscaping, they turn gray, they're gross. Um, so some of the plants that you'll see, that you can see uh, from the nature trails and some of the plants that we've tried to protect out there, this is a white fringed orchid, this is a ground orchid. It's a listed uh, species here in the state of Florida. Um, it's very beautiful. It's, it's a very, very beautiful flower. Um, and they, we, this, this sort of, the project that I work on sort of got started because somebody found one of these at Deer Lake. Just one. So we, we got that area cleared out and we found 40. Mm. And we found, we found over a hundred. And now we have, I don't know, a thousand or so, a thousand or more out there, all down this one seepage slope. Um, and part of what we do at the garden, we also collect seeds from these, take them to the garden, they grow them in a, in a micropropagation lab, and then they, we bring them back down and we replant them out in, in these areas. Mm. And so we can augment the population where it's not so strong. But where it is strong, they came back like crazy. Um, <laughs> they're very, they're, they're truly pretty. You see a lot of spiders and stuff on them. So what I did is I was interested in what, what pollinates these, because I didn't see a lot of stuff on them pollinating during the day. It's a white flower. It would have great visibility at night. So what pollinates them? And sphinx moss are what pollinates them. You can see there, this is the proboscis of the moth. Wow. There. Yeah. So the nectar for this flower is down, all the way down at the bottom here. This long, yeah, there here. And so there's a tiny hole. Got to find that go all the way down. But that's how the plant gets pollinated. That's how they, that's how they reproduce. And so I thought it was pretty fascinating. I, noticed, I started noticing a trend. Moss came early on the evening, just after dark, and then they would come again much later, around one or two in the morning, um, just based on the camera. I did find stuff on there. There was hummingbirds that visited. There was butterflies that visited during the day. But most stuff didn't have anything long enough to get down to the nectar. That's the only, only uh, thing we saw that was able to do that. I found these at Top Sale last year. Uh, we didn't know these were even here. Um, and I worked at Top Sale three years and never found them. I left, came back, was doing something else, and there it was. Uh, but these are yellow fringeless orchids. They're the same uh, family as the previous one. They just don't have a fringe, a little bit smaller, very pretty. Um, if you see those anywhere, tell somebody. Uh, some of the pitcher plants you'll see. This is a trumpet pitcher plant, tall, yellow. You'll see a lot of bugs and stuff hanging out near the lip. Um, it's sort of like a light on your porch. They know stuff is attract bugs are attracted to these pitcher plants because that's what the pitcher plants eat. And so they hang out there. You see frogs and spiders and all sorts of things that are hanging up to the side. There's a lot of color variation on these. Sometimes you'll see them all red. You'll see red veins. You'll see red necks. You'll see just like a little line of red. And sometimes they're just all yellow. They have a lot of variation in their coloring, um, which leads to uh, a lot of nice like, pictures. Uh, so this is one of red with a red neck over at Deer Lake. They ha they excrete a sweet substance around the lip here. The inside of the of the pitcher is waxy, and so bugs can't get out. They slide along the surface and they can't get out. 
um, and then they fall down and they're digested in the enzymes. So these plants have adapted to live in these very nutrient poor areas. They don't, that's how they get, basically how they get all their nitrogen is through insects. Because uh, there's, there's not a lot of it in the ground. Like a lot of our pine needles, oak leaves, all that kind of stuff, all the stuff that breaks down doesn't have a lot of nutrients, which is why we chip all those trees and take them out because that will add a lot of nutrients to the ground and, and not be healthy for these plants. Uh, this is their flower. They flower in uh, March, February, March, part of April. Uh, and real quick about the flowers, they are unique. They don't allow, they don't allow themselves to be self-pollinated. So the bug has to go in one way and then come out another so it doesn't rub and pollinate itself. And so it ensures that it gets genetic diversity. And all the flowers are like that. However, they will cross-pollinate. And so you will get you will get uh, hybrid pitcher plants um, occasionally out, out there. And we've seen several several mixes, and those are really beautiful because they take characteristics of two of the two different plants. So they'll be low in, the, in yellow, or they'll have white tops. You know, and be in there's uh, all sorts of variations. <coughs> this is a uh, white top with uh, green link spiders. Again, a lot of stuff is attracted to them, so they 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 hang out on the top and they will pick off stuff that comes over there. I've, I've seen this a lot where they uh, eat a lot of insects that come to the, to the plants. You'll notice this one has hairs along the edge here. It, those hairs help those bugs find their way into the, pit, into, the, uh, into the soup down at the bottom. It prevents them from going out. It'll, it'll only allow them to go against it and go in. And they're one of my favorites. They're very, very pretty. So the, a pitcher is just a modified leaf. It's just a regular leaf on a plant. It's just modified to be able to hold uh, liquid. <clears throat> Purple pitcher plants, we have a unique species here called the uh, Gulf Coast pitcher plant. Um, it's different from the ones that occur up north, uh, only in the flower. It's a, they're, they, they're purple, reddish, green, um, and this is their flower here. You can see that the, uh, they don't have a lip over the top, so you can see the liquid in there. Um, and this is their flower. This is what makes them different from the one up north. The one up north has a red flower, whereas ours has a rose-colored flower, kind of a pink flower. It's very pretty. Uh, parrot pitcher plants, small on the ground. They call that because the the actual pitcher looks like the beak of a bird, um, which actually uh, this little fin here helps the bug find its way. They'll hit, they'll come up on this, and then they'll go one way or the other. That way's good. That way's bad <laughs> for the bug, anyways. But there's a lot of variation in the coloring of those two: green, red. Uh, but they're always small. They're always along the ground, um, and they're in the wetter areas. Another carnivorous plant, spoonleaf sundew. These catch bugs by um, these little dew drops here. That's why they call them sundew. Little dew drops in the edge of the pads there. They are sweet. Bugs are attracted to them. They get stuck on there, little small little bugs. And then they digest them right on the surface of the plant. They don't actually close their pad. The one that's closed in the middle is actually, is actually opening. It's new. Uh, they just, they're just stuck there. You'll see bugs stuck them all the time. And you'll, this is one you'll normally see. The one previously I showed you is actually a list of species that's rare. Um, and this is the one that you see everywhere. This is the pink sundew. Very much the same, same as the uh, other ones. It comes in a thread form as well, which are a little bit taller. You can see the bug stuck there. Uh, he wasn't having a good day. Um, I, like, I like these because they're, they're really they're beautiful spirals at the top. And they all have nice little pink flowers that are kind of small and dainty. Um, but here's what it looks like out in a wetland over Deer Lake. You see the red leaf sundew, purple pitcher plant on the left, um, old flower head up top. And one thing about these plants, they eat bugs, but they also need bugs in order to, to reproduce. And so they throw up their flowers up above the danger and usually before they make their new leaves. And so like the flowers from, for pitcher plants and for sundews will be much higher than the actual plant itself because it needs, it needs that pollen. And uh, that's the way. That's the way it's, it's going to be able to do that. And so, like, especially with pitcher plants, they usually flower as they're making their new leaves because the leaves will die off in the winter. And as they're making their new leaves, they'll flower. They'll go away, and then they begin the process of eating everything that they can. Um, so these are really pretty. You'll see these a lot. They dot the landscape out there in wet prairies. Pine lilies. Um, that, they have a nice, like the nice uh, leopard spots there. Um, they occur in and around this area. Uh, you'll see them in all three parks. Uh, Barbara's buttons. I only like this one because my grandma's named Barbara. And, uh, and they also have these great spirals in the middle, and they are extremely beautiful. Um, you'll see whole fields of these in these wet, wet areas. Um, you'll see a lot of them. Uh, grass pink orchid. It's also it's, um, a ground orchid. 
there, we have three different species of these at all three parks. Um, and they vary in color from dark magenta like this to almost white. We have a, a, a pale one that also occurs here. It looks like it's got its arms raised like that. Um, and they are, they're also very pretty. You see those especially after we, after we burn. They really like the, uh, the new fresh growth after a burn. <coughs> uh, rosebud orchid. If you ever, get a, you ever see one of these and you can get down low enough and smell it, it smells just like vanilla. It's wonderful. Um, I, I, it's got like, looks like it has like, the three arms raised there. Uh, they're very, they occur on the upper, drier portions of the uh, wetlands. Um, and it, it's in a species that occurs only in this area. Uh, like the Panhandle, South Georgia, South Alabama area. Uh, Blazing Star, this is a fall blooming species. This is, uh, you see a lot of purples and yellows in the fall. It's really the color, flower colors you see in the fall. And um, you see these along the wetlands, also in the uplands. You'll see these a lot everywhere. Uh, so some of the wildlife you can see, this is a coach whip. This is a uh, snake you'll, you'll see uh, in the uplands and out near the beach. Um, it's got a red head. This one's eating a five-line race runner. Those are very hard to catch, so you know that snake, if, that snake is fast. Um, but you can see here, on the edge of its scales, it's kind of dark in color. It, that's why they call it a coach whip, because it looks like a braided whip. Um, don't let anybody tell you that they will whip you. They will not. I've tried. Um, but they have a nice kind of a reddish head. They're really, they are a beautiful snake. But you'll see them, they'll be quick, then we move along into the dunes. Uh, ribbon snake, you'll see these a lot. Uh, them and garter snakes. Uh, rough green snake, you'll see these out in the forest a lot. They'll be up in the bushes, up in the trees. Um, that's, that's how they blend in. Um, you can tell what it is because it has rough scales if you're willing to get that close to see it. Uh, so this is, this is one of the dangerous ones here, diamondback. Um, you may see these, they are, they, I've seen them at, at all three parks, um, in various sizes, I've seen some very large ones, still. Um, and they're absolutely beautiful if you see them in the wild, but just don't get too close. Uh, you're very, very likely to probably see these, the water moccasin. Uh, South Walton is almost all wetlands, and so they, these um, snakes like the wet areas. This is a young one, young ones can be, can be uh, you can tell that they are young because of the uh, stripes you see on them. As the older they get, they get darker, much, much darker. You don't see the stripes. Also, they'll have a little yellow tail. Um, I stepped on this guy doing some mapping over at Deer Lake. Uh, I think it was a surprise as I was that I was there. Um, and it was, I'm happy with my presence. And this is what they'll do. This is how, why they call them a cotton mouth. They will rear back and open their mouth at you and warn you, like, I'm dangerous, stay away, you need to go do something else. And so I did. I went out and did something else. I listened. Uh, especially after disappearing, <laughs> uh, especially after disappearing in the underbrush, on the, like in the direction I was going, I was like, oh, well, I'll just go the other way. Uh, people will ask you sometimes if we have alligators here. I used to get that question a lot as a ranger at the parks. Do we have alligators? The answer is yes, we do. Just not that many. Not that many. Uh, this was a big female who made her way into uh, No Name Lake over top sail. She raised several uh, broods of. Uh, of Little alligators, I'm not sure what little babies are called. Uh, she actually started at Camel Lake and she marched all, her and all of her babies across the tram road through the dunes over into No Name Lake where she raised them. Um, this was actually, I got very lucky. She was actually doing the, uh, the, the low growl they do uh, during the mating season. Um, this is one of her babies here. Uh, they, would all, they would hang out at the end of the trail that led down to No Name Lake. So you'd walk down the trail and then they would all scatter. And I was like, well, I kept thinking, well, why do they keep hanging out there? You know, people come down here all the time. Like, why do you just go to the other end of the lake? But they hung out there, and she would hang off to the side and just watch you under the sign that said, beware of alligators, so. <laughs> uh, we have bald eagles. We'll see those around a lot. Um, there's a nest at Four Mile Village uh, next to Topsail. Um, there's also a nest up by the bay over by Topsail. There's a nest somewhere near Deer Lake because there's two of them uh, hanging out over there uh, quite a bit. Um, I see them in the woods over there a lot. Fighting with the owls raise a lot. Uh, great horned owls, you'll see these a lot uh, flying ahead of you out in the woods. They look like a really big bird. They, you, it just kind of moves off real sleep. Um, you hear them a lot at night. This time of year, they do their. They have a mating call, so you hear them a lot at night. Um, you can tell the difference between a male and a female. The female hoot ends on an up note, and the male hoot ends on a down note. Hmm. So you can tell which ones when you hear them going back and forth. You can hear which one is the male, which one is the female. 
And I'm not going to do it for you, but when you hear it out in the wild, you will you go, yeah, I know what he's talking about. It's very obvious. Uh, you'll see occasionally see red-tailed hawks. These are our big hawks. Uh, they are very robust, um, hairy legs. This is these are our, this is a red-shouldered hawk, and these are a little bit smaller than the red tail, and they have white wing windows, wing bars there, so they're they're a little bit easier to tell what they are. Uh, as I mentioned before, I've seen fox squirrels come back. Never seen these before down here. I saw one at top sale. Nobody believed me, so I had to get a picture of it so they would believe me. Um, but sure enough, we do have we do have fox squirrels that occur down here, and I've seen these now at top sale, and I've seen them now at um, Deer Lake. And my mom could confirm that because she was there <laughs> when we saw it. Uh, this is a gopher tortoise. It occurs in the uplands, a endangered species that we have that occurs here. We are currently working, we just had a meeting not too long ago, I keep saying we, I don't work for the parks anymore, the parks had a meeting that I was sort of present at uh, about reintroducing gopher tortoises into the area. And that's something that I wanted to do for a while because like I said, our uplands are in really good shape. They like uplands um, and for a long time the parks have been not open to that because they carry a, a respiratory disease when you bring them in from the outside. Uh, gopher tortoises have a respiratory, respiratory disease occasionally. But we brought up the point that that respiratory disease is everywhere. And so they're not going to be introducing it here. It's already here. You know, it's, it's, there's no place where that doesn't occur. And so we wanted to be open to being able to bring them back and augment our... Because this, this is one of the slowest species to recover. Like I said, fox squirrels we've seen, quail, turkey. We have not seen the return of these, even though these areas are very ripe, very healthy for, for these animals. We just haven't seen the return of them. There's just not that many. Uh, I found this guy walking along the Rock Road over in Point Washington State Forest, just north of the park. Uh, we have old we have old burrows. There's a healthy population at top sale out in the dunes. Um, just haven't seen them in the uplands in some of these areas. And so hopefully we'll move forward. We'll be able to uh, um, bring some of those back. Uh, you may see some of these. This is a uh, black bear. Um, uh, I saw this was at top sale. You were with me that day too. Uh, this was a big bear. It's a big bear. Um, a lot of times you'll see this is the size you'll see here. This is a much smaller bear that likes to get into trash. This was getting into trash over at Top Sale um, by the cabin area. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had to scare it off. Um, I, one quick thing about bears. Um, the bear population in, in, inhabited, in inhabited areas has grown. The reason for that, a lot of people don't know, is that bears will have uh, cubs based on the amount of available food. Mm -hmm. So they have what's called delayed implementation of the embryo. They get fertilized, it sits there for a while, and then they start, then they start baking, the, uh, baking the bread. Wow. And so what happens is, some years you have a lot of acorns, you have a lot of uh, saw palmetto berries, and some years you don't. It's just the, part of the natural cycle of, of things in the wild. And so in years when it's really, really heavy, there's a lot of food, the bears are, can they take in a lot of calories, they can support more cubs with, with the, the amount of food that's available. And so that sends a trigger that they can support more cubs and they will have more cubs. One wow. to two, two to three, wow. as opposed to years when there's not much food, they will only have zero, maybe one, because they just can't support it. So when there's food available, human food, garbage, that's very high in calories and that sends signals to these female bears that they can raise more cubs. And so what that does is it artificially inflates the amount of, uh, of bears in an area because they, they're, they're not getting the natural signal. So bears in natural areas do much better than bears in human areas. Um, and that, that's why you see it, it, more cubs leads to more males. The males are the ones that roam around and end up getting into trouble mostly because um, they're looking for new territory. And so that's, that's really what ends up happening and why you see more bears and more human bear interactions in a lot of areas. They're getting false signals. So lock your trash up. Um, and then, of course, white-tailed deer. The other day after the burn, I was driving down 98 to look at all the, look at the fire that was back in the woods there at night. And there was two very large bucks over there, over at, at mm -hmm. Topsail. There's a very large buck that lives in the West End. Um, you can't hunt there, so no ideas. <laughs> uh, but this is at Topsail. This is from the boardwalk. Um, you'll see a lot of deer there. You'll see a lot of deer in the cabin area over at Grayton. You'll see uh, um, deer uh, in the dunes over at Deer Lake from the boardwalk. This is the, uh, the uh, tracks through the sand. And they're not, people are, you're not allowed to feed animals at a park. Um, you're not allowed to pick flowers and all that stuff at, at a state park. So they're not, these, these deer have no pressure. So uh, when I go into work, I, my office is at the cabin area at Grayton. There's a, there's a little fawn who just hangs out by the road. And you can just pull your car up and 
from being at the stool from that from that little fawn. Just hey, you know, you get a good look at them. Uh, and the, they walk out back behind our office all the time. You'll hear them crunching down the thing, and then you'll look out the out the door, and here she is looking in at you. <laughs> Um, and you'll occasionally see them on the beach. Uh, it's not extremely common, but it's, it's kind of common. You'll see them out on the beach quite a bit. This is over at Top Sail. I know they've been seen on the beach in several areas along, um, along 30A. <coughs> so, to wrap up, um, if, if you know any more information, we do, um, I, I run, I'm one of the people that runs the Instagram uh, account for Atlanta Botanical Garden and the conservation. It's at AG, uh, ABG Conservation. There's also a web page. AtlantaBG.org Atlanta Atlanta slash conservation. If you want any information about the stuff we do uh, as the garden, um, or you just want to see nice pictures of some of the stuff that we do out there in the woods, um, we post on there. We also post from all of our other projects that we do throughout the southeast, um, of which I'm only part of this one. Um, Florida State Parks, they have a new website. Very slick, it's very nice, finally. Uh, FloridaDEP.gov forward slash parks. And I mentioned a unit management plan earlier. If you want any information on any park in the state of Florida, you find the unit management plan. It's got all the information from every single park in there. Um, everything you want to know, plants, animals, acquisition history, anything. It's all in, in the management plan. State managed lands have to have a management plan, uh, a 10 year management plan. So they're updated every 10 years. It goes through a public process so you can come, give information, you can give ideas if you have any ideas. Uh, you can come help prevent things from happening um, in them. Because um, the entire plan for a state park is in that plan. They want to put a campground in, it's got to be in the plan. They want to put a road in, it's got to be in the plan. And so everything is, that, that shapes everything they do. They, you have to change it through an amendment process, and that has to go through the same process. So it's very difficult to change once it's done. Uh, Top Sale is getting ready to do theirs. They are in the process of doing theirs right now. There will probably be a public meeting sometime early next year. Uh, they will be having their... Uh, management plan meetings over there. Um, you can also get the rules for the state park, like no alcohol on the beach, no dogs on the beach, um, like fee schedules, all that kind of stuff, and that's through the Florida Administrative Code 62-D, and that can also be found on that website there. There's not many, there's not a whole lot, um, but if you ever want to know exactly what the rules are at a state park, um, because a lot of people don't know you can't have alcohol on a beach at a state park. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> um, I don't think anybody knows that, actually. Uh, you know, dogs was the other big one. That was the other big one that I was mainly concerned with. Uh, no glass on the beach. Uh, it's all sorts of things like that. But it's all in there. It's not a very long document. I'm also part of a group that is uh, focused on water quality issues in the area, specifically the uh, deep well injection uh, well up in, up in Jackson County, um, a.k.a. the garbage juice hole up there. Um, so we formed a group, and if you want any information on that, you can go to Safe Water for Walton on Facebook. There will be uh, information concerning all of that um, on there. It's very important because our water here is connected to the water up there. Um, one of the things I do is help improve water quality you know, on the surface here, but all of that water is connected underground um, throughout the area, through the aquifers, uh, uh, deep underground. And so it's very important. And so for more information on that, you can go check it out on Facebook. I'm also part of a group called Let It Be Forest. All the information about the upcoming meetings for unit management plans, things going on at the state park, um, really pertinent issues, development around the state park, um, all of that can be found uh, right there on letitbeforest.com. Um, and it's an important resource if you are interested in getting involved in, um, in issues concerning protection of these conservation areas. <clears throat> and then also, shameless plug, you can follow me on Instagram. Um, I post uh, pictures uh, like, like you saw tonight on there, uh, along with, with information and all kinds of sorts of stuff. Um, I don't do political stuff, so feel free to uh, come enjoy you know, what I have to say. So with that, I went a little long. I went a lot long. Uh, I'll open up to any questions if anybody has any questions about anything. Yeah? Yeah, um, some of the plants you mentioned, um, how you collect seeds? Is there a way to get access to some of your seeds if you want to do natural planting? Um, there is, but not through the parks. So we have to we, we have to get a permit, uh, a research and collection permit, in order to collect any seeds, any plants, any cuttings, all that kind of stuff. Um, you can do that, but you have to have a very good reason to be able to do that. So if it's like for like a public garden or something like that, then um, you could do it that way. 
uh, and you can contact the park. They, it's all handled through the district office in Panama City. Um, as far as through the garden, no, because we, we, they're very strict with their permits, and so we don't want to mess that up. Yeah. But there's, there's other resources out there to be able to get these get the plants like this. Uh, there's pitcher plants are very popular to grow in bog gardens at their house. The little white plant that looks like a morning glory. Mm -hmm. What is that? That you, is one that is a, that is a morning glory. It's, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's a morning glory. It is. Oh, it is a morning glory. <laughs> yeah, it's a. It grows on the beach. I don't know the exact species of it. That's now. fine, but yeah. we we saw it really low to the ground, and I thought. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they sometimes call it railroad vine. Okay. But yeah, it, it is a morning glory. Okay. Those those flowers will melt off in the heat of the day, yeah, like yeah. me. How about the turtles? I don't do turtles. That's 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 a whole other group. I don't do turtles. Turtles get all the glory. Turtles get all the glory. And I love sea turtles. And I was and I was very fortunate enough to be able to work with them at Top Sail um, and at Grayton. Uh, moving, I moved some nests. Um, very poor site choosing by by the females. Uh, and but. Yeah, the turtles, they, everybody knows about turtles, so I'm hoping to spread some awareness about some other beach nesting um, critters. Yeah. Uh, the area at Great where the cabins are, uh -huh. what did that used to be? Because there's old roads out in there. So, yeah, it, it did. It, there was a developer had it, um, and sometime in the 70s, um, he put in the roads, he put in the sewer, Put in all that stuff. It was it was actually slated to have 100 and 190 lots between wow. Little Redfish and Alligator Lake, south of 30A, wow. not including um, Gulf Trace, which is a ton. That's a lot of lots in there. Uh, if you ever saw the, if you ever, it's in the it's in the plat book for the county. If you ever get a chance to look at it, it's phenomenal. It's this the what what they were planning to put in there. But I think he spent all his money on putting all that stuff in. I think it was a group. I think they spent all their money putting all the roads in because uh, they put a sewer treatment plant north of 30A. It's actually within the state park right now. Um, as you go towards Grayton down 30A from the cabin area, there's a just after Alligator Lake on the left, there's a little trail that goes up. And that's actually, there's a water treatment plant back there. They were That was planned to treat the water in the area. Uh, and I think they spent all the money doing that. And then, uh, and then they went bankrupt, and the state was able to, to get that land. Um, it's an important piece of property. There's a lot of nice habitat on it. Um, and then they decided that would be a good place to put the cabins, and, but not as dense as 190 <laughs> cabins per, per in the area. Um, one thing that makes great and unique, and one thing I love about it, and is that it has a unique cabin experience. So at Top Sail, when you stay in a cabin, you're just in the regular part of the park with the, with the campground, with the general public who goes to the beach, and so you share that. At Creighton, you're actually in a separate area. You're not at the main park. You're not near the you're not near the, the campground. You actually stay in a separate. You got a separate gate. You get your own private beach, um, and so it's not it's it's a really unique experience for a state park because you don't have that. You can't get that anywhere else. Um, we, uh, one of the issues that we worked on was the state was trying to buy seven acres of property out the Little Redfish Outfall, and part of the deal was that they wanted to put improvements in at the cabin area. They wanted to open that up to the public, put a parking area in, put bathrooms in, um, and all that. And it was a bad deal. It was a very bad deal. As I mentioned, the unit manager plan clearly states in there, there was a, there was a plan to, to fix the park. The roads need to be fixed. They, they are the original roads from 1968. You can see the shells. Uh, you can see individual shells in the, in the road. Uh, the bridge needs to be fixed on the way out to the beach. The, they need to put in bike lanes and a, and a sidewalk out there to help improve safety for people walking from the campground because we want to encourage people to walk and bike, and they do it anyways. And so why not give them a space to do that? And then improve the parking area at the main park. There's enough space at the main park in that parking lot to put the number of spaces in that they wanted to put at the cabin area. And so we wanted them to, to take a look and do that stuff because it needs to be done. That's great. It's a big moneymaker for the state. Great. And Top Sail, both are very big money makers. Two of the highest revenue parks in the entire state. St. Andrews uh, and John Pennycamp are, you know, are kind of round out the list. And it's mostly because of the cabins, because the cabins are a little more expensive. But a lot of people come to the beach there. A lot of people come to the beach at Grayton. And so we wanted them to improve that instead of building more stuff that they had to take care of later on. Pour some money into the cabins like, like we wanted them to. And so... It was, it was, that was a no-brainer. That was a very bad deal because they, it just, we wanted the land. I wanted them to purchase that. I've been wanting them to purchase that piece of property forever, but not under those conditions. So that's one of the issues that, that we, we 
um, we sort of work on and get the word out about. Yeah. Um, I'm with a uh, beat, um, it's complicated here, but let it be forest. I've got stickers here that if anyone wants one, you can have one. We are a branch of an organization, Beach to Bay Connection, which is a 501c3 that was founded in 1993. You might even remember Beach to Bay Connection if you've been around here a long time. And our mission has always been to preserve and enhance the, the public lands in South Baltimore. And I remember Deborah Wheeler, when she first moved here, asked me, she was interviewing me for something, she goes, I thought the government did that. And I said, no, sometimes we have to protect the state parks and forests from the government, whether it's the state or the local. And um, we're kind of getting real active again, and this is our program, Let It Be um, Forest. And so if anyone wants a sticker, please grab one. I've also got some other propaganda here. We have some several issues coming up, one of which is uh, lots of times we have developments, and if you remember, if you've been here a long time, you remember the Great and Grand. We kind of decided that the whole wetland area there, uh, we got a better project uh, in the wetlands there, uh, the DEP even said that. They said, you know, it takes, it takes the public to get things done right. That's what we do. And uh, we've got a big, long history, and if you want to pick some of this stuff up, follow what we do. Because how many times do you go, I don't know what to do, who to write to, what the issues are. Our Facebook page, our web uh, site page says, here's the issue dealing with our state parks, here's who you write to, here's what you say. So, we got that for you. <coughs> Any more questions? Well, could we give Jeff a big Thank round you. of applause? <laughs> and friends of South Walton Sea Turtles would like to thank you for your thank time you. and your lecture. Absolutely. And this was just absolutely phenomenal. And so I do want to let you know that through the fall winter, we try to do an educational offering once a month. Um, as important as our state parks are, and you just saw the glory of creation through Jeff's eyes and his camera and his discussion, but the next lecture is a major risk and threat to what Jeff is working so hard to preserve. We are going to... Another one? <laughs> <laughs> we, <clears throat> December 13th, before your family arrives for Christmas and maybe before you leave for Christmas, we're going to have Dr. Laura Tur too. She is a marine science agent for the Walton and Okaloosa counties, and she's going to be discussing microplastics. Um, whether you have been on the shores of the outfalls or you've been down on the beaches, you see the big plastic because we all leave it behind. Um, but what you may not really be paying attention to is that as those plastics wash out and they get brittle from salt water and they begin to break up, let your eyes start looking for those little bitty chips of blue and red and think about that in massive bulks. Um, I'm not your expert, but Laura too is. So December 13th, Right here, 6.30, she's going to come talk to us about it, how we can impact that as humans, and if that is one of your things, she may have some other ideas to get you involved. Um, so please don't miss that one. Tonight, we also had two of our volunteer beach ambassadors go by the TDC and get every one of their Coastal Dune Lake DVDs that they had available and they're on the back table for you. So if you already have one, maybe you'll leave one behind, but if you do not have your copy of the Coastal Dune Lakes, these are by the, um, how do you say their name? Elon Solstice. Yes, and these guys were in the area for what, about a, a year, a year and a half? I worked with them pretty extensively at Top Sale. Yeah, a lot of research. So this is the real deal. This is the real education. They're free, and they're back on the back uh, corner. 
And then one more last announcement Beth will make from the back. So Beth, or come on up if you want to. Mm -hmm. Beth is the president of Friends of South Walton Sea Turtles. We are a nonprofit, so we are now competing for the best Christmas tree over at Grand Boulevard. Yes. So tell them about well, that. Well, de we're decorating it um, Sunday around 12 o'clock until we get done. Mm -hmm. So anybody who would like to come by and help, particularly if you're nice and tall and get to those tops. The Christmas, team, the Christmas tree theme is really cool. I took all the garbage that you guys collected, the BBAs collected and Turtle Watch collected, and um, we're being creative with it. We're, we're painting it um, white and silver and putting sparkles on it. And um, I've gotten the Seaside School involved, and they're helping me. They're our class. And um, so we're decorating it on Sunday. Anybody want to come by? And then if you can't come by Sunday... Tuesday between 4 and 6 is the voting of the best tree. So if you could go put a vote in, um, it's, the, it's recycle and reuse at its best. So thank you for coming tonight. Thank and we'll you. see you on December 13th.